los Goku Records, no, si que quieres ver algo así. A ver si Entonces, coincide. Ni siquiera puedes coger los premios porque A ver si coincide así. con mi recollection de todo lo que inventa este hombre. Ya no puedo este, sostener mis lentes, el papel y el micrófono al mismo tiempo. Bueno, ok. Muy bien. Así como la canción. Siempre que sí, pero nunca. ¿Entonces empezamos? Sí. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Eh, Marisa me cedió el micrófono, entonces voy a presentar a Enrico. Eh, Enrico nos va a hablar hoy de... Necesito bifocales. Heavy Element Synthesis in the Universe. Eh, para los que no lo conocen, Enrico Ramírez Ruiz eh, es investigador y faculty member en el Departamento de Astronomía y Astrofísica de la Universidad de California en Santa Cruz. Eh, él estudió la licenciatura en física en la Facultad de Ciencias, aquí al lado, y después hizo la tesis de licenciatura en Los Álamos con Ed Fenimore sobre asuntos de destellos de rayos gamma. Después de eso se fue a Cambridge a hacer el doctorado con Martin Rees, donde estuvo hasta 2004, 3, 2003. Eh, y después del doctorado en Cambridge, eh, fue al Instituto de Estudios Avanzados en Princeton, uh, donde fue eh, miembro de largo plazo, eh, trabajando con muchísima gente, hasta 2006, 2007. ¿no? Y desde entonces está en la Universidad de California en Santa Cruz, en el Departamento de Astronomía y Astrofísica, eh, recientemente, el año pasado, hasta octubre del año pasado o algo así, estuviste de sabático en, el, uh, en Harvard, en, el, en el Radcliffe, este, con un Radcliffe Fellowship. Y eh, Enrico también es miembro correspondiente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias desde 2011. Eh, ha trabajado eh, en… Pensé, pensé que iba a platicar historia. Bueno, si quieres, hago historias, pero... Eh, Enrico ha trabajado en una eh, gran variedad de temas de astrofísica de altas energías, de estrellas de rayos gamma, eh, dinámica en cúmulos globulares, eh, evolución de estrellas masivas y eh, interacción de eh, eventos uh, transitorios con el medio ambiente y sus manifestaciones observacionales, fundamentalmente de un punto de vista teórico, pero también haciendo... Eh, Um, interacción cercana con las observaciones. Ha recibido una lista larga de premios que está en la síntesis que me dio este Marisa, um, en, entre ellos grants importantes para inicio de carrera de, de NSF, ha tenido iniciativas para que estudiantes mexicanos vayan a los sitios en los que ha estado en Estados Unidos, en particular en Princeton hace algunos años, de hecho eh, Fabio estuvo en una de esas hace unos años, cuando todavía era estudiante de posgrado, si no me equivoco, y eh, hace algunas lunas, ¿sí? <risa> y eh, más recientemente recibió un, un grant para trabajar en el Dark Cosmology Center en Copenhagen de cuatro años o cinco, cinco años, eh, que va a requerir que esté algún tiempo ahí. Eh, entonces, eh, me da mucho gusto que Enrico nos visite y que nos dé esta charla. Está aquí toda la semana, si quieren platicar con él. Está ocupando mi oficina, como yo ya no ocupo mi oficina tan seguido. Eh, entonces, si está ahí, si quieren platicar con él. <risa> ¿Tienes micrófono? Sí, yo aquí, perfecto. Bueno, muchas gracias. Este. Ya, perfecto. Bueno, me, me pidieron que diera la charla en inglés porque hay un par de gentes este, que no hablan castellano y así no tienen que escuchar mis pochismos, entonces va a estar bien. <risa> Este tiene un lance, ¿verdad? Ah, sí, perfecto. Ok, so I'll, I'll tell you about heavy element synthesis in the universe. And in particular, I want to contrast two sides. This is the core collapse supernova side and neutron star mergers. Uh, let me give you an uh, outline. So first, I really want to explain to you how elements heavier than iron are actually synthesized. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the R process. So I'll explain why I mean with the R process. Then I'll tell you about the observations in stars and what they tell us about the abundance patterns that we see uh, in, in those elements. 
And then I'll move to talk about these two astrophysical sites, which are the type two, the core collapse supernova explosion and the neutron star mergers. And I'll really wanna highlight three aspects of, of this. You know, how is the R process made in these systems? Where is the posit? Where are those metals deposited you know, in the galaxy? And when, compared to the age of the universe, are they deposited? You know, it is clear that type two deposit the elements right away because their lifetimes are very short compared to the age of the universe, while mergers actually there have a delay, intrinsic delay. And this has been a topic of huge debate for the past 30 years. Because I'm biased, I'm gonna talk about neutron star mergers as sites of our process nucleosynthesis. And the hope of this talk is to convince you that in fact, we now have strong evidence that half of the elements heavier than iron actually come from neutron star mergers. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that. And then I'll tie everything together uh, in a framework of the formation of the Milky Way and explain whether or not we can actually you know, reproduce the abundance patterns that we see in the stars in the halo of the Milky Way. So everything that we know about nucleosynthesis come from high resolution spectroscopy observations of the sun. Yeah, so for astronomers, this is our periodic table. And of course, we have taken great care in going from you know, a beautiful spectrum like this to actually look at the abundance pattern of the sun. So I wanna highlight how this actually uh, pattern contains a lot of really interesting information. The first thing that I'm gonna highlight is basically these closed neutron and proton shells. And as you can see, this is basically N equal two, C equal two. And as you can see, the abundance peaks in the graph here correspond to neutron and proton closed shells. As you can see, iron is the heaviest element that basically has the symmetry. So it has basically the same magic numbers. Uh, but as you go beyond iron, you can clearly see that the difference in the closed shells start deviating with atomic number, which tells you that these elements, you know, have a significantly larger proportion of neutrons. Uh, something that I really want to highlight is this peak, this peak, uh, which apparently appear not to correspond to neutron closed shells and proton shells, but I will, I will actually explain that they do. They just actually made very far from equilibrium. So the hope is that I will explain how this pattern arises, and of course, lead is the next one, which is doubly magic, which is basically both closed shells of neutrons and protons. And these elements are, of course, the most stable uh, uh, nuclei. Another thing that we can clearly see is, of course, the y-axis, which tells us basically the amount of material uh, per unit mass formed in these elements. And as you know, the majority of these elements were formed in the Big Bang in the first three minutes, most of the hydrogen and helium. Nucleum Nuclear burning actually uh, created all, uh, you know, all of these elements up to iron. And then you really need neutron capture to create elements heavier than, than iron. And the reason is twofold. The first is of course that as you fuse, you generate energy. So this gives you exothermic reactions. And the reason why stars can survive their battle against gravity is because this fusion is actually giving them energy to the system. And as you know, iron is the most bound nuclei. And at that point, basically, nuclear burning ceases in the interior of stars. So if you want to create elements that are more heavy than iron, you actually have to give energy to the system. That's one problem. The second problem, which is actually basically deadly, is that the Coulomb barrier drastically increases with atomic number. So if you want to use charged reactions to make these elements, you know, the standard temperatures that you see in the interior of stars are not high enough for charged reactions to give you elements heavier than iron. And as a result, almost exclusively, all elements heavier than iron have to be produced by neutron capture, okay? So how does neutron capture proceed? When you capture a neutron, you become radioactive and you beta decay. So if the capture rate is slower than the beta decay, we call that the slow process. That means you capture a neutron, you beta decay, it takes some time, you capture another neutron and so forth. And that's called the S process. 
if, you ca if the capture rate is fast, faster than the beta decay time scale, we call that the rapid uh, process. And you can see here the abundance patterns from both of this. And what I want to explain to you is how is it that the S process uh, basically coincides with these closed neutron and proton shells and how the R process pattern seems to be shifted to the left in atomic number. You know, every time you see here the third peak, the R process is basically uh, shifted to the left. And I won't talk about the rare peak element, which in fact that's not associated with any magic number. And at the end of my talk, I can explain you why. Uh, now, we test the R process, so this is my favorite peak in the R process because it has gold and platinum. Uh, gold and platinum are basically primarily produced by the R process, and we use europium because it has a, a very strong atomic oscillator strength to test the R process contents in stars. Okay, so I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this diagram. So what I show here is the proton number and the neutron number. And again, every time you capture a neutron, you move in this direction and then you beta decay. The first thing that you see is what we call the, be the beta stability valley. These are basically the uh, nuclei that are stable and they're basically illustrated here in the black. So if you start moving far away from stability, you know, if you pick a point here, if you move farther away from stability, what happens? The beta decay time scale, as you can see here, starts becoming very, very short. Why? Because these elements are not very stable and they decay. So something important to realize is these are the limits of experimental data that we have in these nuclei. Yeah. So this is also uh, our, our process pathway. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you relies on models of how the structure of these nuclei are far from equilibrium. So this is a characteristic R process pathway. This is about separation energies of a few MeV. Uh, it basically connects you know, all of the most abundant isotopes across this pathway. And the first thing that you realize is that these nuclei are basically processed extremely far from stability. And in fact, just the time scales here tells you that this has to last hundreds of milliseconds, yeah? fractions of a second to assemble these R process nuclei. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the structure of them. So what you see here is the neutron shells, which are close, and the proton shells, which are close, yeah? So what happens in these uh, neutron shells? Why are they so important? Uh, and these are the so-called magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82. All of these you can get with spherical nuclei, but once you get to 82 and 126, you actually need nuclei that are not, no longer spherical. Uh, so what happens? Well, here I show the neutron capture cross-section of nuclei on the, S, on the S process for a neutron energy, which is about 25 kilo electron volts. The first thing that you realize is that there's an odd mass, you know, that odd, that odd and even numbers have different cross-sections. So you see these odd mass numbers tend to have higher cross-sections than even nuclei. And in fact, this I didn't highlight when we looked at the abundance patterns, but you can clearly see the odd, even asymmetries here in the patterns very clearly, which are associated with these changes in the cross-sections. Something that is very evident here is the substantial lowering of the cross-section at the magic numbers. Why that? Because these nuclei are extremely stable. They don't want to capture neutrons, and therefore their cross-section is very, very small. Not surprisingly, you expect abundance to anticorrelate with the neutron capture cross-sections. Why? Well, you can think of it as you're basically capturing neutrons. You can imagine that as a flow, and as soon as you get to these magic numbers, you get a stagnation in the flow. That means the neutrons stagnate there, and that means that the abundance peak starts growing at that particular place, okay? So you can think of those as caustics of the flow of neutrons, which basically stagnate at those particular uh, positions. So what happens? Well, imagine that I'm building the R process. So I start capturing neutrons, and then I arrive to a magic number. These magic numbers don't want to capture neutrons, so I basically capture neutron, beta decay much faster, capture neutron, beta decay more faster. I move over on, you know, almost vertically, and then I'm able to 
cross this magic number and again. So what you're seeing here is the stagnation of the neutron flow at those specific locations. No? So if you think, let's focus on the S process. So in the S process, I'm moving very close to stability. I reach this neutron magic number and I stagnate there. So I expect a peak here. I continue and I stagnate here. I expect another peak. So this is first, second, and third peak. However, because the R process is built so far from equilibrium, I reach the magic numbers where the number of protons is significantly lower. So you can think of the abundance pattern. Once I build the R process, then I beta decay, and the peaks are basically the projection of where I reach these neutron numbers into the atomic plane. Does that make sense? So you're reaching these neutron numbers far from a stability when the number of protons is smaller. So when you beta decay, you know, the, the, the entire pattern moves to the left, okay? So what you're seeing here, as you can clearly see, this pattern basically was made so far from stability that when, when you beta decay, it naively appears that there is no magic number here, but of course the neutron magic number was reached far from stability. And that nicely explains why the R process peaks are actually shifted to the left compared to the S process peaks, okay? So something that it's very important to keep in mind is that no particular element is made by the S process or the R process, and that both uh, processes can contribute to the formation of an element. For example, uh, here lead, yes, is primarily S process, but R process contributes about 10% of lead. As I said, my favorite peak, gold and platinum, that is almost exclusively made by the R process, yeah? So these precious elements are only ma made by the R process, but things like barium, for example, there's a contribution of the, you know, of the S process. So you can think that about half of the heavy nuclei above iron are made by these S process, and half, they have to be built rapidly. Mm -hmm. That's not shifted with respect to anything. So there's basically no magic number for that peak. So the argument is either the nuclei around that region, uh, the nuclear structure has some interesting uh, binding energy uh, uh, band, or the one that most people argue is that the fission fragments, when you actually capture neutrons, some of the nuclei actually break, the fission fragments have a stagnation at about this point. But in fact, I would say that this is one of the most controversial open issues for nuclear astrophysics as to how you can make this peak, and there's two, two different ways. But now we're gonna have observations actually of nuclei around this region, and I think people are gonna understand the nuclear structure right there, but you're right. This peak is basically not associated with stability of nuclear structure, but there's something else. And of course, it's important because we use europium for everything. Okay, so something that you can learn just as an order of magnitude is when you have small neutron velocities, uh, the neutron capture and cross-sections vary as one over the velocity. So if you want to ca calculate the, the capture rate is simple and sigma v, but because sigma is inversely proportional to v, what you realize is that the time scale for capture solely depends on density, which makes perfect sense, no? The higher the density of neutrons, the higher the capture rate. So let's, let's put some uh, time scale. So for the S process time scales, which are around tens of thousands of years, I only need densities that are relatively low of neutrons. While R process time scales, which are order of microseconds, I need very, very large densities. So the simple conclusion that you can do for the R process is based on the time scales. Well, what object has a time scales of milliseconds, a neutron star? and densities that are close to nuclear density, a neutron star. So the only sort of viable candidates are something that involves either the birth of a neutron star or the merger of two neutron stars. And I won't talk about the, uh, the S process very much, but we know that the neutron flux that comes from carbon and oxygen burning, uh, or even or side reactions of helium burning like this, can produce enough neutron flux to make the R process, and in fact, we see the S process made in real time in evolved stars, okay? So I will focus in sort of 
of this unknown origin of at least half of the elements heavier than iron. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, observations. Uh, this is my favorite star. Actually, everyone that works in our process, nuclear synthesis, love this star. This is usually known as the Chris Neaton star, and it doesn't look like anything interesting. Uh, this star is actually very low metallicity, and remember that here we're using the logarithmic scale, so it has one part in a thousand of the iron content of the sun, but despite that, it has a europium enhancement of about 500. Yeah, so this star has 500 times more gold than our own sun. But something that is remarkable is if you plot the R process abundance pattern of the sun, which is given in this blue, the patterns are very robust. Yeah. Even though you expect this star to have formed a long time ago, you start getting hints that whatever is producing the R process has to produce an abundance pattern that is extremely robust. And I would say in the, fa in the past five years, you know, evidence has really accumulated uh, on a wide range of stars that the abundance pattern is extremely robust. Yes, the normalization changes. That means the amount of gold and europium content per unit mass of the star is changing, but the relative fraction of elements is the same, okay? So if you wanna make the R process, you make sure that it's very independent of the initial conditions and that even if you change them, you converge to an abundance pattern that is actually extremely, extremely robust. So these are the two uh, ways, as we talked about in making the R process. This is the type two supernova, this is the neutron star mergers. As an order of magnitude, if you, wanna pr if, you want, if you count all of the gold in all the stars in the galactic halo, and you come up with a, how much mass there is in the total halo, the average mass formation rate for our process is about 10 to the minus five solar masses per year. Yeah, this is for a galaxy like our own, which is forming one solar mass of stars per year. Now, not surprising, uh, core collapse supernova happen about once every 100 years and are thought to produce mass that is about 10 to the minus five. So if you multiply 10 to the minus two, multiply by 10 to the minus five, you get the magic 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. Neutron star mergers, on the other hand, happen much rarer, and this rate is extremely uncertain, but if, you know, they happen about once every 10 to the minus five years or so, and they produce about 10 to the minus two solar masses. And again, if you multiply these two numbers, you get about the same rate, okay? So in terms of mass production, these two things are very comparable. But for a long time, we've been having this problem that there's lack of sufficient entropy in this scenario to actually produce the R process. And I'll explain what that means. Okay, so this is probably the most technical uh, view graph that I'm gonna show you, but this, this gives you a feeling of how the R process is actually made and how it depends very heavily on the initial conditions. So th this is the how contrasting these both scenarios. So the first thing that is important is the dynamical time scale of the mass ejection. Why? Because as you know, the beta decay time scale is very short. Uh, for neutron star, for, sorry, for core collapse or newly born neutron stars, the ejection time is about 100 milliseconds. That's basically uh, if you divide the radius of the proton neutron star divided by its decay velocity, you get about 100 millisecond. The difference here is that the material is not very neutron rich. So we use a lot of what we call this electron fraction, which is actually shown here. So if you have equal number of neutrons and protons, this is one, so this is 0.5. So an alpha particle has a YE of 0.5, okay? So this is slightly neutron rich, but not highly neutron rich. So what happens in this scenario? So when this material is in falling into the neutron star, it gets hot, it gets photo disintegrated, and basically what you have is neutrons and protons. Yeah, you have an ocean of neutrons and protons. Then you basically start expanding and you start producing alpha particles. And in this situation, you don't have any heavy nuclei. So you have to make the targets, yeah? How can, how can I make the targets? Well, you have to make the targets with what we call these neutron catalyzed triple alpha reactions. Because I have to get from alpha to carbon. And of course, because there are three body interactions, the time scale is very long. So that's a problem. Uh, another interesting thing is that you don't wanna use all your neutrons 
to make carbon because then you cannot make the R process. So what you need is basically a lot of neutrons left and very few carbon atoms made. And that ratio depends very sensitively on the entropy, which is the energy per unit mass of the system, and the standard neutrino core collapse give you entropies that are a factor of 100 lower, and what you end up with is basically tons of carbon and not many neutrons, okay? So you don't have basically the targets uh, or the neutrons to make the R process. The situation in neutron star mergers is very different because the ejection time scale is about 10 milliseconds, but the material is extremely neutron rich. So if you ask in nuclear statistical equilibrium, what is the distribution of nuclei that I see? It's shown here. I already have free neutrons and tons of targets. You can see all of these magic numbers, uh, close to the magic numbers are already populated with nuclei in nuclear statistical equilibrium. So that means that you already have the neutrons and you already have the targets for free at t equals zero. So this is actually, and as it's been proven to actually be a very effective way of doing this. Okay, the when is very important because it's, as I will argue at the end, it's come out with some uh, misconceptions about the enrichment of, of elements in the Milky Way. So as I was saying, in a type two, which lasts only tens of mega years, the evolution of massive stars, the elements are produced, you know, very close to the birth sites. While in neutron star mergers, there is this problem, which is if I wanna take two 1.4 solar mass objects and ask how close to each other they have to be so that they let, you know, they merge in less than a Hubble time, because I have to make them merge by radiating energy and angular momentum through gravitational wave, the answer is a few stellar radii. And you immediately know that their progenitor sizes is, are bigger than a few stellar radii. So the only way that we can assemble these systems is if the neutron star gets embedded into the common envelope of the second evolving companion. And then by the time the common envelope is ejected, the distribution of separations tells you the time scales. Uh, so here we expect anywhere between 100 mega years to 10 giga years of merging time scale. So that means that these, o these objects are not following the star formation rate in the Milky Way or the universe, but they have a delay. And for a long time, people argue because they have a 100 mega year delay, there's no way that I can enrich a star whose metallicity is minus three. And I will argue against that uh, at the end of my talk. Now, this common envelope sounds like magic, but in fact it happens. Why? Because 90% of all the double neutron stars that we know in our Milky Way will merge in less than a Hubble time. Okay, so these mechanisms happen, and as you can see here, orbital periods less than a day uh, or around a day will give you mergers in less than a Hubble time. Okay, so where these elements are deposited, so as I was saying in the type two, this is a clear case, the elements are deposited very close where the star formation rate is taking place, the star formation, uh, in neutron star mergers is not clear, so here I'm making use of uh, the location of a short gamma ray burst, which is actually thought to arise from the merger of two neutron stars, and as you can see, the merger happens very, very far away from the host galaxy, so you expect in this case that you get enrichment of the gas here, and then this gas has to basically fall into the potential well, cool, and form new star. Why is this the case? Well, these uh, neutron star mergers, when they actually get made, they have uh, kicks and they also, the change in mass produces that the center of mass motion of these double neutron star mass has velocities of about 200 kilometers per second on average. So that means that these objects move very far away from their places of birth. And here I show a simulation from one of uh, my grad students, Luke Kelly, in which he actually injected these tracer particles in a cosmological simulation. And this is the distribution of merging sites. This is where the galaxy is. And as you can see, there's a significant fraction of these mergers that happen in an extended halo, if you want. So this is the picture. If I leave you with something in this talk, I wanna leave you with this picture and this silly analogy to make you remember. So type two enrichment of our process is like a chocolate cookie that has a very thin layer, yeah? In which basically you have an event that is very common, but produces very little R process. While neutral star mergers are like chocolate chip cookies. They produce tons of our process, yeah, but they're rare. And the question is, can we tell them apart cosmologically speaking uh, 
these two ways of enriching the universe. And I'll argue that we can. Okay, so I'm going to make here uh, Uh, yes, a little bit, no? You can see these, these are more extended. Uh, so I guess you have to make chocolate chip cookies that have the chocolate in the edges, but yeah. I'll, I'll show you how this actually plays a role in, in the enrichment of the stars that we make in the Milky Way. Okay, I'm gonna just briefly tell you a little bit more in detail uh, how these neutron star mergers produce the R process. Uh, this is, of course, work that you know, everything I know about this subject, uh, William taught it to me, so. Uh, these systems basically evolve and, you know, uh, by radiating angular momentum and energy through gravitational waves. You can actually explain the signal very effectively, if, you know, if you consider the two mass approximation. But of course, what we're interested in is where these objects get close enough, the tidal perturbations start being important. Yeah. And at that point, you no longer can treat these objects as point masses, and they basically become dynamically unstable and merge. So this is a plot uh, made by William. You've probably seen this before, but it's worth making the point that, okay, we don't really know what the nuclear equation of state is. Uh, here we've chosen to use a very simple polytropic equation of state. What does this mean? Well, if gamma is very high, that means that a small change in density leads to very large changes in pressure. And that's called basically an incompressible equation of state, because if you want to compress it, it's basically fighting against that compression by having a large uh, gamma. If you have a gamma that is small, then it's more incompressible equation of state. And this has direct consequence in the structure of the star. When you have an incompressible equation of state, this is the 5 thirds case, you get a very centrally condensed star. Well, you get a very incompressible equation of state, a lot of the mass is in the outer parts, yeah? And if you plot the angular momentum stability, this is of course what you have if you have two point masses, but then you're looking at the steepness of the effective interaction potential of the tidal effects, and as you can see, if you have an equation of state that is very soft, you have to get much closer to become unstable than if the equation is incompressible, and in fact, for the incompressible equation of state that we use and are more consistent with nuclear equation of state, this instability is actually purely Newtonian. You don't even have to use GR to, uh, to explain it. Now, this is very interesting in the LIGO era because if you have an equation that evolves from hard to soft, this is the power spectrum of energy radiated by gravitational waves. So higher frequency means that these objects have to have gotten really close to each other to still emit significant fraction of their power, and therefore you need a soft equation of state, or that if you have a hard equation of state, basically these objects merge and you get rid of all the high frequency. Yeah? So that means that LIGO in principle can tell us something about the equation of state of these systems, which is very exciting. Okay, so this is the type, we use a nuclear equation of state. Uh, we generate these profiles. This is work that I did for my PhD. Uh, as you can see, these objects are not very centrally concentrated, and I apologize here, but this is the gamma as a function of radius. So you can, gamma is of course the local partial derivative of pressure with density. So as you can see, gamma is three all the way until the edge of the star. So this is a very incompressible equation of state, and this is the electron fraction distribution. And as you can see, this object is extremely neutron rich. Yes, yes. So people have done these uh, with sort of magnetic fields that are comparable to the pulsar magnetic fields to start with. And what they see is they see rapid amplification of the field. And, but the field really never gets to be fully dynamical. It's, all, it's like 10 to the minus two of a Kipertition. So you get these fields of about 10 to the 15 or so. so the fields are not drastically changing the equation of state, uh, but they're certainly very important in transferring some, in transferring the angular momentum. So you have to take that into so account. Is it possible to distance more incompressible? Only, only if the, only if the, only if the energy density in the magnetic field is comparable to the, you know, and because these are basically subdominant, they not necessarily, but maybe in the outer edge, yes, no, where the magnetic fields are basically comparable to the, to the pressure there, no, because they tend to buoyantly rise. 
so this is a, you know, one of the calculations I did for my PhD. This is two equal mass objects. As you can see, you get mass shredding in the outer Lagrangian points. Why? Because you have to conserve angular momentum. And really what we're talking about is only 1% of the mass in this system, in the tidal tails, that is able to get above the escape velocity. And this is where we believe the R process is made. Okay. So yeah, I want you to focus your attention. This is a guarantee side of the R process, which is the small amount of mass that makes it above the scale velocity. The material of the gold that you're gonna produce is actually gonna collapse into the newly formed black hole. So the field of you know, numerical relativity has really exploded in the past 10 years. Uh, Yes, it depends exactly on the initial conditions that you use, the equation of state that you use, whether or not you have magnetic fields or not. But the general agreement is that you eject between 5 times 10 to the minus 3 to 5 times 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. And the velocity of these tails is anywhere between 0.1 to 0.3. And this is related to the scape velocity at the outer Lagrangian points, which depends on the equation of state mainly and the mass ratio. Okay, so here I'm going to show you how the R process is made in real time in the tidal tails. So the time scale is here, it's very quick. These are the initial conditions. And as I was saying, the initial conditions have tons of neutrons and you already have the target there, okay? What you're gonna see is how the abundance is actually made. And ultimately you're gonna see the R process made and then decay. Okay, so the neutron capture takes place. You can see the clear stagnation in the magic numbers. And then quickly beta decay to stability, and you can see the first, second, and third peak, okay? And as, <clears throat> okay, so what you're seeing, and this is, you know, after 30, 40 minutes, yeah? And the R process pattern gets established, you know, in orders of an hour. So this is calculations that uh, my grad student Luke Roberts uh, made, and what we use here is an R process network with neutron capture, photo dissociations, alpha and beta decays and these fission reactions that I was talking about. So how much our process this produces, and I'm gonna use my favorite element, gold. So how much gold one of these elements, one of these mergers produces is about a Jupiter mass of gold. Yeah, so about with, you know, $10 per gram, this is a very expensive merger. No. If this is not impressive enough, this is about the gold, the amount of gold storing about six million stars. Yeah, and again, the analogy of the chocolate chip cookie makes sense because one of these uh, produces so much gold. Uh, so the, the argument is, if I'm born close to the chocolate chip cookie, I should have very highly enhanced R process, and if I'm born far away from the chocolate chip cookie, I should have a weak enhancement. Can we see that in the fossil record in our galactic halo? Okay, so. I'm gonna finally talk about clues from chemical evolution. The first thing that is actually striking, which already tells you that there's something interesting, is that if you look at the magnesium as a function of metallicity, uh, this is of course for stars in our halo, which are red, and stars in the disk, which are blue, which tend to be much younger. So magnesium is an alpha element and it's primarily made by type two supernova. So if you wanna claim that type twos can produce both our process and magnesium, they should have similar, you know, RMS fluctuations. And what you can see is that stars have a wide range of content of europium compared to that of magnesium, yeah? Which is, in, in some cases, is drastic, no? So that tells you that maybe not all type two supernova can make the R process, and therefore that means that the mass per event has to increase in order to give you these magic 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, these two stars, which have about, you know, similar iron metallicity, but very different europium content. Something I wanna highlight too, is that only a few percent of metal poor and old stars show clear R process signatures, yeah? So not every single star has been enriched by R process, at least to the limits in which we can see these lines. And, and here, you know, the, the difference is just very, very interesting. If you look at the calcium lines of these two objects, they look very similar, but if you look at the europium line, this one is very deep and this one is fine. So here you have two objects that have very similar iron content but drastically different R process, almost by a factor of 500. Another extremely interesting new result 
is that you see high changes of European content in dwarf galaxies, yeah? So you're now looking at things that have very small stellar masses. So if you have very small stellar masses and you have something that occurs very rarely, there's gonna be some objects that are enriched and some objects that are not. You're already in the statistical regime in which basically having one merger makes a huge difference. And this is exactly what you see. This is a Nature paper recently by Alexander in which you have very stringent limits of the content of europium in a one wide range of dwarf galaxies, but now you have clear detections of europium with enhancement that are a factor of 100 larger, yeah? Which already is hinting at this idea that what you require is an event that is rare, yeah? Because as you know, the mass metallicity relationship extends almost all the way to these uh, systems, yeah? So other elements like alpha elements do not show these large variations again, and those are produced by type two, which are more common. Okay, so can we test this? Yes, uh, and in order to do this, uh, we're using the area simulation, which is a very high resolution simulation aimed at reproducing a Milky Way today. This calculation was done by a grad student in Santa Cruz, Javier Aguedes. Uh, and basically, this system is picked to reproduce the stellar mass of the Milky Way, the dark matter content of the Milky Way, of course, within the uncertainties, and the current star formation rate or the star formation history of the Milky Way. And here, the resolution is about 120 particles. So the best way to illustrate this is with a beautiful movie uh, that Javier made. The flaw here that you see is the gas. Gas that cools is purple, and the stellar light is pink, okay? So Javier put a lot of effort into trying to find a merger tree that did not experience a major merger during the life of the Milky Way. Yeah? As you know, the Milky Way is very unique because only 1% of Milky Ways today have not experienced a major merger. We know that we're gonna experience a major merger, but not today. So this is basically, after a while, the movie becomes a little boring because there's not many things happening. Uh, but as you, you can clearly see the infalling of satellites as a function of time. And we're getting you know, closer and closer to the formation of the sun, the time scale for the sun. So the way that we do this simulation is of course we put type twos, type one A's, and our process. These process basically deposit elements, those elements mix in the gas and produce new stars. And the question is, you know, can we compare the abundance patterns of the stars that we make with those that we see? So even though if it's very quiet and it's really a beautiful movie. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Remember that the majority of the dwarf galaxies in our own Milky Way were, you know, were basically, you know, came between Redshift of two and three. So right now, yes, there's, there's really not many satellites falling in. Okay, so what I show here is the star formation rate, but I, you know, we chose it to show it to you in the core collapse supernova rate in units of centuries, so this is here as a function of time, look back time. Uh, and then what we do is we assume that no neutron star merger can form before 100 mega years. And then we assume a delayed time distribution of one over time, which is standardly used. So what, when the 20 or so double pulsars that we see, when you plot them as a function of their separation, their separation is logarithmically flat. When the separation is logarithmically flat, you get that the delay time distribution is one over time. And that's the distributions that we use. So this is the, the merger rate. And you can see it's of course delayed compared to the star formation rate, but of course the units are much smaller because this, this is per mega year while this is per century. So we wanna contrast both. So we wanna make sure that they both produce the same R process in the Milky Way today. So we basically change the mass per event here to be five times 10 to the minus two. And in this case, it's 7.5, you know, 7.4 times 10 to the minus five. And when you do the integral, 
they produce the same amount of R process today. Uh, a little bit of the simulation. So we assume, of course, type two trace the star formation rate. And in fact, they're a major determinant of, of feedback. And we assume that type one A trace the stellar mass. So you can think of the stellar mass as a probability distribution that we use to inject these type one A's. And also we assume that mergers trace the stellar mass. So they're significantly more extended. Something that you notice here is that if we have no mixing of metals, no turbulent mixing of metals, we start getting into complicated situations in which you can get a star that was actually enriched by a type 1A, but not by a type 2. And that's basically not seen in the observation. So the data is here, and this is basically the distribution of the abundance of the stars that we produce. So if we put an average diffusion coefficient, which is actually very reasonable, we can actually get very, you know, very good agreement with the alpha particle distribution of the stars that we see today. And we use, of course, the same mixing criteria for the neutron star mergers. And, you know, not surprising because we're forcing, uh, in some ways, these objects to produce the scatter that you see in alpha elements. But what is very interesting is that the neutron star mergers produce basically the range of, you know, RMS fluctuations very well at low metallicity. Yeah. So when people see these, they say, how is it possible that you can enrich stars whose metallicity is only 10 to minus three? You know, this argument was basically the reason why neutron star mergers were not taken seriously for the past 25 years. So I'm gonna explain to you what people got wrong. The argument is very simple. If you take the Milky Way and you calculate what is the mixing time of the Milky Way, which is comparable to the sound crossing time, that's about a giga year. So you cannot possibly assume that the Milky Way is chemically homogeneous during the first giga year of evolution. And to illustrate this, so here I show uh, a recent model by Matteucci, where it's a closed box model, where they basically have the rate of metal production and they assume that the metals basically are mixed instantaneously. And you get this, and these basically are chosen to have the same initial conditions that ours. Now, if we take the average abundance of coal gas, this is what you get, almost a perfect agreement. But what does that mean that the average abundance, basically, it's very, very different from the abundances in which the stars are made. That means that the RMS fluctuations of the abundances in the early Milky Way are very large and you cannot possibly assume that you're basically mixing instantaneously. And even if you assume a delay of 100 mega years, as you can see, these are basically the abundance distributions we can certainly produce, you know, even after 100 mega years and after a giga year, we can enrich stars with our process. Yeah? And the difference has simply to do with this assumption that the early universe was chemically homogeneous. And I, you know, this is, for example, I think, the beauty of doing these 3D simulations in which you can really capture the multidimensional uh, properties of the problem, and clearly the answer lies in the fact that the Milky Way is not, you know, perfectly homogeneous in terms of their metal content. So what I want to leave you with is that mergers are in fact consistent with our process enrichment at low metallicity. As you can see, this is the data uh, using various standard parameter. Uh, another important thing uh, is that we also find that the dwarf galaxies can vary drastically in europium abundance. This is the example of two of them. They have similar mass, but one has basically 50 times more europium than the other. Why? Because this event is rare, you know, the probability of having enriched one of these uh, dwarf galaxies is small, and therefore you get large variation and low stellar mass. Uh, so just to su summarize, uh, I hope I can convince you that we have a robust nuclear pathway. Uh, as Diego mentioned, uh, here is a compilation that I made of all the abundance patterns calculated by about 20 groups. So we're not quite there, but the, the difference are small. And as you can clearly see, there's still very, very high, you know, strong difference in that European peak, depending on the assumptions that you make uh, on the nuclear physics assumption. And interestingly, I think we're coming to a picture that these are process, of, you know, enrichment by these events that produce tons and tons of our process but are rare, uh, it's consistent with the observations that we see in the halo stars. And of course, maybe while I was talking, uh, 
LIGO actually announced that they may have detected a neutron star, neutron star merger. Uh, although I don't know, William's not checking his phone in real time. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Gracias. Questions? Enrico, probably I didn't understand very well, but uh, why the observations show, wh wh how you can explain that in these very ultra dwarf galaxies like, like Reticulum that you show it, the abundance are so high. Uh, this means that uh, there are a lot of mergers, neutral mergers start mergers in this, in this galaxy, or because it was enriched by the uh, mergers by the uh, own, or own galaxy. What is the explanation of this so very high? If you, if you take an event like this one that happens once uh, 10 every million years for a star formation rate of one solar mass per year, mm -hmm. and you convert that to stellar mass, that means that the stellar mass to have one neutron star merger is about 10 to the 6. If I have st you know, stellar contents of 10 to the 5, that means that I have to get 10 dwarf galaxies to have one in one of them. So what I show you there is that there was basically one that basically had an excess merger compared to the average merger. But of course, the RMS fluctuations of mergers at low mass is very high. Mm. And that's, that's the argument. So the other uh, dwarfs have low. Very low. Very low. The only one is reticulum. And this is because of this fluctuation that you say. Yeah, I mean, there's still some debate uh, as to whether or not, you know, you know, I, I argue, and you should have uh, given me a hard time, that the average velocity of these systems is 200 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can you retain one of this right. in a dwarf galaxy whose average scale velocity is 50 kilometers per second? Now, we know that we know of neutron stars in globular clusters, so we know that a fraction of those are retained. Now. So, but it is, it is interesting that people are trying to understand. There's another really beautiful, uh, which I didn't have time to talk about, which is looking at sedimentation in the ocean floor uh, in the earth, where you actually, you know, you, escape, you, know, you see the, the plutonium-244, which is radioactive, and you compare the variations of that with those of the early solar system, and you see large variations. So the argument is that these, our process came in the forms of dust, to avoid, you know, to make it through the magnetic field, and that sedimented. So you can think of the solar system as a sail catching up all of these dust particles, and there's large fluctuations on the abundance of those individually. So that's also that you can only explain by a process that is rare and produces more mass. But you're right that this is, this is fairly simplistic, and I think lots of work needs to be done, because you don't really know if, you know, where the gas came from. Was that gas accreted? Will it belong initially? Uh, what were the cooling properties of those gases and so forth? But just statistically, I hope I answer your question. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Isn't it the halo stars, the ones that are really responsible instead of the dwarf galaxies? from your conclusion? Because you are, you're putting all the, the neutron star collisions on the outskirts, no? Yeah, so I guess I, there is this debate as to whether or not the, the majority of the halo stars were formed in the disk, or they basically are disrupted you know, systems that form the halo. Surprisingly, this is of course not my field, but what I see is that the variations of say the globular cluster uh, abundance variations and the dwarf abundance variations, if you plot them on top of the halo abundance, they seem to match relatively well within the RMS fluctuation. No? But I think people, I think in these simulations, you know, you have to worry about feedback and these things, and that will determine what fraction of the stars in the halo are actually made on C2 versus came from satellite. So I, I would say that this is just a proof of concept, and you know, I wouldn't claim that, oh, 80% of the halo actually was formed in the disk. And if it was forming the disk, that means that this gas, as you said, has to basically fall into the potential well, cool in the disk, and then form stars versus actually being formed in the satellites. And I think I'm expecting that you should see difference depending on the merger tree that we choose. Any more questions? You can also 
injection, I mean, mass injection from clusters, not just from ejected systems from the field, right? You mean enrichment by those? Yeah, I mean, the problem is that, you know, only, what, 0.1% or 0.5% of the total stellar mass is in global clusters, so by rate, you start getting into trouble. <laughs> you don't get a very thick disk in your simulations. It's very thin, no? The disk that you get most, almost all the time. Yeah, I mean, remember that our resolution is only 120 parsecs. Okay. No, so based on our resolution, since you're seeing the entire Milky Way, uh, the scale height of the disk is actually probably five or six times what you see in the Milky Way. But I don't think, I w you know, I wouldn't believe at all the scale heights here because they're really resolution dependent. You know? And of course you're making, you know, rather than making one star, you, you know, your stellar mass particle is like a million. So you're injecting all that energy locally and you naturally tend to puff up the disk because the energy can obscape. Yeah, so I don't think these, I don't think any Milky Way simulation can explain the scale height of the disk to date. But only if you do a local one and you only resolve the Any last question? Okay, let's thank Gracias. everybody.